Okay, awesome. Thanks, Christine and Sean and uh, Mark Russo and Sarah Stone and Bernie, all the MAPGA education uh, crew that helped put this stuff together. And um, I want to welcome everyone to our education <laughs> seminar with Kate Performance. Um, thank you. Sorry. I'm honored to have Noah and Rick speak today and share their expertise in a field that is super important to me uh, personally. I've known Noah and his family for over 25 years and they hold a special place to my heart. Uh, his family means a lot to me and have been instrumental in not only my career as a golf instructor, but even more to me as a person. Um, a little about the seminar today. Noah helps run the Center for Athletic Performance Enhancement, which is the leading mental performance coaching team on the PGA Tour, founded by his mom, Julie Elion. Every week I travel on tour, I see the great work Cape and the team do with notable students, including last year's U.S. Open champion, Wyndham Clark. Noah grew up in, at Columbia Country Club, working first with John Scott, myself, and Bob Dolan, and neither of us could fix his strong grip. Rich, a former United States junior amateur champion, is a Class A PJ professional and a lead performance coach at Cape. Rich also has worked previously as an assistant pro at the Chevy Chase Club. Rich and Noah will discuss what Cape does, how the mental landscape is changing, and how instructors can, can prepare. And again, if you have questions, Sean will be monitoring the chat on Zoom, so please enter your questions through that. And without further ado, Noah and Rich, it's all yours. Thank you, John Scott. And nice to see everyone. Um, John Scott, as you know, the aliens feel the same way. Um, so thank you for inviting us to do this. And always good to see you and hopefully we'll see you at some events um, in this upcoming swing. Um, so we're really excited to be here. Um, as John Scott just said, this is meant to be as conversational and for you guys as possible. Um, so however you wanna take it, whether there's certain questions you have about players you're working with or players on tour or whatever <clears throat> we can answer for you, this is really meant to be conversational and totally for you all. Um, so put the questions into the chat. Um, the presentation piece of this will take like 25 to 35 minutes, depending on how quickly or slowly we move. Um, and then I'll stop screen sharing, open it up, and it can be whatever you guys uh, want it to be. Um, okay, so what is CAPE? Um, CAPE um, is the Center for Athletic Performance Enhancement. Uh, my mom started this in 1997. Um, the quick background is she was a therapist um, and a client of hers was receiving marriage counseling, um, like regular sort of therapy client. Um, and one week he invited her to come out to the John Deere Classic. We're from Bethesda. Um, so that was easy. Um, and um, the yeah, long story short is he ended up winning that week um, and asked my mom to stick around for the year for the season because um, he really liked working on the stuff they were working on, you know, in therapy on the golf course. Um, and through that, he ended up referring a bunch of other clients. And by the end of the 90s, my mom was sort of doing this weird thing, which was, you know, ended up turning into sports psychology or performance coaching. Uh, but came from being a, a therapist um, for, you know, professional golfers. Um, in that time, she's worked with half of the top 10 earners on the PGA Tour of all time. Um, so has been doing this at a really, really high level for a really long time. Um, <laughs> largely that has been sort of under the radar. Um, and for whatever reason, I don't know if it's sort of social media um, or the stigma on this stuff changing, but it's become a lot more um, in the open in the last year with um, some of her clients talking about their work together, which um, John Scott mentioned one of them, but Wyndham Clark was a, you know, an amazing um, example of what this work can do um, and how it can sort of change golf and change someone's life. Um, but also Justin Thomas over the last year and Max Homa over the last 18 months or so, um, and a handful of other people that do and don't talk publicly about this. Um, so who are we? Um, so my background is in entrepreneurship and business. Um, I was running my own company. And then when Wyndham won, um, really started helping my mom um, with some of the challenges that 
um, we were experiencing and sifting through the opportunities um, we were having. And so that's really my background, but play golf, um, play D3 golf. Um, like John Scott said, grew up playing at Columbia Country Club. John Scott was my first uh, swing instructor ever. Um, so while I haven't changed my strong grip, you would think that my first swing instructor was the one who could have really helped me from the get-go. <laughs> Um, but still working on it. And I actually did send him some swings yesterday and I think they are looking better. Um, um, and also uh, my first job was caddying at Chevy and um, loved that. Um, while I love working for my mom, there was something really special about getting paid in cash um, and also exercising while you work. So that was a really good one. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy to be here and excited to introduce you to uh, Rich, who's a really talented performance coach of ours. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. John, nice to see you again. Um, the, uh, let's see, a little bit about my background. I, I played a lot of junior golf, and um, I was uh, won the U.S. junior, ranked number one in the country, went to Stanford, uh, was uh, captain of the team. After that, I worked um, as a, a PGA pro. Um, I, I worked in uh, um, both the, the Northeast and uh, – was in the mid Atlantic section for a little bit. Work, worked at Chevy. Worked for Jim Fitz. Same time, Straws Ball was there, and then uh, Jack Skilling was assistant pro at that time. And uh, it was Jack uh, who was assistant coach at Stanford, and um, I caddied for him in the uh, the the finals of the Tour Championship at the Tour School. Um, long time ago, Jack was a great player. So. Um, but since then, I, I, um, I ended up working for Hank Haney, and I was national director of instruction for Nike Golf Schools and Junior Camps. I uh, got a degree of, in counseling psychology with an uh, emphasis in depth psychology. And uh, so I used those skills you know, with my players, helping them uh, develop their games as junior golfers, uh, helping them and their families, uh, and then in college, and then some as, as professionals uh, over time. And so um, uh, really happy to be here and share some of my, uh, some of uh, our, uh, our work, our work. Um, and just as you can sort of start to see a trend between Rich's background and my mom, um, one of the things we do really differently, like on a spectrum of traditional sports psychology, um, which would be sort of like, I think the stuff people think about when they think about golf mental coaching, like intermediate targets and pre-shot routine. And on the other side of that spectrum being counseling and psychotherapy, where CAPE is very much in the middle um, where our performance coaches can really flex either way. Um, so like Rich has a master's in counseling, our other coaches have psychology backgrounds or something of the like, because um, that's a really important piece of what we do. Um, and what that means is like, for example, we will, a person is a person before they're a golfer. Um, and a lot of the golfers we work with are, you know, 99% golfers. It's all they're thinking about and all they're doing. Uh, but our strategy is much more about helping them as a person and as a human being and as like a father or husband or whatever they are um, before helping them as a golfer. And then, you know, getting to, a health or happier foundation and then bringing that on the golf course, sustaining it on the golf course, practicing it on the golf course, and then sort of finishing the loop and helping them become a champion. Um, but that background um, of our coaches and our origin is a really critical piece of what CAPE does differently. Um, and with that, um, I would say an important piece of this too is like in a swing lesson, you know, I, I don't know if this is true and you guys would know this better than I, but what I've heard from instructors is in the first like three swings, you can probably tell what's going on. Um, maybe it takes a couple sessions or whatever. <laughs> you can look at a video um, with this stuff. It's really not like that um, because what we're talking about is like if we have a 25 to 35 year old player who's been doing something sort of mentally incorrect for, you know, 15 to 20 years, um, it won't take that long to fix, but it might take a little while to really get in their head and figure out what's going on um, and be helpful in the way that we like to be helpful. Um, 
And so that's a really important piece of what we do differently. Um, the other side of this is we take a really holistic approach to helping athletes. Um, and so what we mean is like under a performance umbrella, which is what we do, that will include the mental work that we do, um, but also include nutrition, also include meditation, fitness, analytics, and medical work. Um, so like we're sort of um, the point person on the mental stuff, and that's, you know, the bulk of the work we do, but we're also the point guard um, and, you know, doing the full court press on all of these other areas. Um, and that holistic approach where we're investing in everything and looking at everything and uncovering everything is a really important piece um, because it all, you know, like what we eat really affects the way we think and the way we sleep. Um, and our analytics will, you know, tell a different story or the same story or give us other indications of something. Um, and so that's the, the way we do it. Um, and what I would also say is for non-PGA Tour players without shot link and, you know, other stuff, you can still do a lot of this work. There's still really critical analytics um, you can be tracking and fitness you can be working on. Um, and so that's not just for top players, but the holistic approach is really important for um, any player. Great. And um, are we going to move on to the? Yeah, um, Rich, you want to talk about sort of the way people think about improving their games today and um, how we look at that? Sure, I'd like to do that. Um, you know, in the call in the culture of, of golf, the way that it's set up is that if people are um, interested in improving their golf game, are there? Uh, you know, the, what they do is they go get a full swing uh, lesson on their mechanics in general. Um, some people get help with their short games, um, but beyond that, um, there's, there's a tremendous amount uh, that people can do to help uh, their performance, uh, not just, uh, you know, on the golf course and playing, but also, you know, a lot of the players I work with compete. But, um, you know, if I list the kinds of uh, the amount of things that people categories of things to actually uh, learn about and get better at. It's over 150 things, um, uh, you know, in performance. And, uh, you know, the golf swing mechanics is just a small sliver of that pie. Um, but in general, most people just go and, you know, they, they want to go work on their, uh, on their swing. And if they're not playing well, it goes back to their mechanics or something they're not doing well. Um, and, you know, I'd like to, you know, open up the door to, you know, thinking about more of, that, more of that. And then, but also the thing is, where do you go get that kind of information that's beyond just swing mechanics? You know, you can get some information and, and help with your short game, I think. But, um, you know, beyond that, in general, most, you know, golf lessons or clinics, Etc. are focused on the mechanics of those things. And performance has to do with a lot more than that. And I think that the pie chart here shows that, you know, there's been an evolution in, in, in golf. So, you know, I remember um, when Henry Griffiths, Griffiths came out, I can barely say it, Henry Griffiths, uh, when, um, you know, they came out that big cart and they're doing some um, uh, club fitting, you know, that, that was an evolution, you know, for, uh, for golfers and, you know, it's because it's, it's, uh, you know, a lot more people are, are of course fitted for golf clubs. Now it's a big part of the industry and, um, you know, there are different levels of that, but just that it's, it's available before there wasn't too long ago when before club fitting wasn't even part of the game. And now I think TPI has brought in the body, you know, how do you integrate, you know, somebody's body, um, and when you're given a golf lesson, um, you know, before, you know, people would just give a golf lessons and not take in, 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 into account the body. Um, I think that, you know, if you have, uh, issues with mobility or strength that can really uh, hinder your performance and, and really make an impact of whether you can 
even change your mechanics in the way that you're you're looking at. And TPI is really educated uh, people that you know to take the body in consideration to do the screens and then also uh, develop the body along with um, you know swing mechanics. And um, you know so that has really happened. But you know the mental side of the game um, is still something that's really not a big part of the culture yet. I think that a lot of people are giving it lip surface, that mental performance is important, but what does that mean? You know, how do you actually do that? And how many people are educated in, in, in doing that? And one of the things that at Cape, you know, not just um, there's uh, golf, um, you know, sports psychology, which in the realm of sports psychology, um, that in the, in the category of psychology would be kind of cognitive behavioral, which is kind of the surface stuff. It's important, you know, how self-talk, um, your routine, what you're doing physically, those are important things, but, you know, there's a, there are deal, deeper elements to, uh, you know, a person's psyche and, and uh, psychology that in what we do in, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, and we have, and the way in which we do things, you know, brings into account and can explore other things that are really affecting performance beyond that. Um, so anything, anything to add to that, Noah? I think that was great. Okay. Great. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Yep. Okay, some examples of mental challenges. Um, you know, we can pretty much, you know, pick out any of these and uh, talk about them. I think that I'm gonna just explore maybe one of them, let's see, uh, blow up holes. So we all have uh, clients who, uh, students who um, go on the golf course and, and um, have some bad holes. And so they, you know, want to know why they want to know, be able to, uh, to, to improve, um, on that. And, and, um, but how many, uh, PJ professionals have the time to look at and talk with, um, uh, their clients, you know, the, and, and talk about things that are beyond, uh, swing mechanics of why they may have, uh, not, uh, performed well on a few of the holes and, um, you know, some pros have time to do that and many don't. Um, and one of the things that we get to do is that we have people on contract. And so that allows myself, for example, to be available, to text, to um, talk with my, my clients before, especially before uh, um, uh, competition. And I get a lot of, I have a lot of time to be able to listen to them talk about their games and about what's going on in their lives and how they're practicing, how they're integrating swing mechanics, mechanics, for example. So if somebody has, you know, somebody's, if I'm talking with somebody and they have blow up holes, you know, I start to ask a bunch of questions and we start to explore the things that are on the golf course that help them have those, those blow up holes. And it could be mental things that they're thinking about, it could be feelings and emotions that, that happen, but it also could be uh, course management. Um, it could be uh, nutrition, it could be a, a myriad of things, but by being able to take the time and really ask a lot of questions about what's going on, we can help to find out, oh, what, what affected their performance in a negative way? What can help in their performance you know, in the future to do it differently? But then I wanna say that what happens on the golf course often is, um, you know, a, 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 you know, I guess a, a way to put it for myself is that what happens on the golf. I look at, at competition or or performance on the golf course as a test, and you can learn things, um, you know, about that about about testing, but it's really all the preparation you do before you ever play that round of golf that really impacts your performance on the golf course. So how you're practicing, what you're practicing, uh, how you're integrating those, those mechanics. There are so many things about uh, how you're 
performing in your practice that will influence um, your performance on the golf course. So for example, if you you have somebody um, who's practicing, let's say they're hitting balls on the on the driving range, and you know they hit a few poor shots on the driving range, and then they start um, to immediately think that they need to fix their swing mechanics to be able to to hit the ball better, and that's how they practice. So they start really thinking about their mechanics um, while they're hitting shots on the driving range, and that's how they practice especially when they hit a, a few poor, poor shots. That same player, invariably, when they're out on the golf course and they hit a couple poor shots or have a couple blow up holes, they start thinking about swing mechanics and they start thinking about that when they're actually hitting it. And um, that oftentimes, as you know, doesn't work out so well. Um, and so how they're practicing, how they're, they're, they're uh, performing when they're um, uh, developing their games and maintaining their games is gonna really influence them on the golf course. So uh, when they have a couple of blow up holes, you know, oftentimes, you know, I have to go, you know, talking about how they're practicing, what's going on when they're doing that, how, uh, what did they practice? How did they go about it? What are they thinking about when they're doing that? Um, um, and so I guess, um, uh, that's a few things to say just about riffing about, um, you know, blow up holes and some of the, um, some of the things that happen, uh, because of that, um, uh, Noah, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah. And I, I was just going to say too, like, um, I've seen, uh, my mom work with players where, um, there could be something like one of these challenges going on. Um, and it's where like nutrition, fitness, and analytics can become really important tools. Um, like maybe that blow up hole. And so for a PGA tour player versus like a 10 handicap blow up hole can mean something really different. Um, but however, someone's defining blow up hole, um, like that could happen, you know, after the turn around 14 or 15, and there's like a nutrition piece to it. Um, it could happen later in the round and there's like a fitness piece to it, or you're at like a high elevation course. Um, or a really hilly course, and that's a relevant piece to it. Um, and so like the, the, it's just, I, I, the point of this slide is to show that these things are often really multifactorial um, and definitely mechanics can be a really big piece of it. And like, um, you know, you can see what actually happens in the golf swing, you know, through mechanics and a track man. Um, but the other pieces of it um, really matter, um, especially, the lower handicap you get. Um, and on our next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about how these challenges um, and how the mental game is different at different levels. Because I, I know a lot of you guys are working with juniors to, you know, low handicappers to players on the PGA Tour. Um, and so it's really important, but it changes depending on the level. And, and we'll let Rich talk a little bit more about that. Great. Um you know, the, yeah, I think that um, uh, depending on the, the level of golfer and how much competition they play and um, what they're doing with their golf game itself really matters. And uh, for example, with juniors, juniors are really developing their golf games. You know, um, they're, they're, they're learning all the different types of shots to play. They're learning about, you know, they're developing their swing. They're developing how to hit a bunker shot, uh, chipping, pitching, et cetera. Uh, but they're also learning course management, um, learning how to play in competition. Often, um, they, um, you know, um, are uh, learning how to prepare for a round of competition. How do you practice? What should you practice? Um, and that that's true for you know all level of golfers, but it might be a little bit different. Let's say for a low handicap. Low handicappers already built a golf game. They have something that's very ingrained in what they're doing. And so, um, you know, helping them is going to be a little bit different than, than a junior golfer. And um, oftentimes, you know, um, learning all the things that they didn't learn in, um, in just about swing mechanics, you know, and how to practice and what to practice and keeping stats and um, how to think about uh, things on the golf course. Um, can really be helpful. 
And, um, but then we also help elite players perform. And that could be extremely different where there are many things that are going on in their lives outside of uh, their golf games where those can impact um, performance, how they're talking with the media, uh, social media, um, and um, things that are going on in their lives that um, we can explore that really do in, impact uh, performance. Um, so there are many different facets and many different kinds of golfers, but um, there are many ways that a mental coach can help and explore the things that help, that, that, that what a particular person needs to focus on or can focus on that's gonna help their individual performance. Um, Rich, just one question on that, um, something I know we've talked about, um, but so we'll get people that come and say like, you know, is my child too, is my son or daughter too young for this type of work? Or someone is like a, you know, 14 or 15 handicap, like, am I not good enough for this work? Like, what do you think is the right, like, what do you think is the right level and the most effective level where um, starting to think about mental coaching or really investing in mental coaching makes sense? Uh, that's a good, that's a good question. You know, I often myself in my own history really don't work with that many kids, you know, earlier than 10 or 11. Um, I think that it can be helpful, but generally the work uh, before that uh, has a lot to do with, uh, you know, working with parents, helping them help their kids. You know, oftentimes, you know, the parents love their, their kids and they really want to help, but um, doing that well, doing that effectively, um, uh, you know, somebody like a, a mental coach can really help uh, the, the, the parents. Once they get to be, you know, like I think 10, 11, you know, they, they, uh, they start to develop their age and, and development where they can start to integrate and take in a lot more information than before then, in my experience. And so, uh, you know, at that age, you know, developing um, all, the all the parts of their golf game, but then, uh, you know, bringing along the parents with, um, as a triangle, for example, um, uh, you know, the, the, the parents have an opportunity to be able to talk with, uh, with a mental coach or a coach, uh, um, and, uh, the, the coach can talk to the junior, but get a lot more information with the, with the, from the parents about what's going on for that junior and how to help them, uh, develop and what's unique to them in their personality. You know, people are very different. Um, so Yes helping cool. them at all ages yeah yeah okay um and um a little bit on our focus um it's very much um helping so we we do a handful of things but our bread and butter i would say is helping um you know like people ranked 30 to 150 in the world be a top five player and win a major and um, like our work is really focused on helping people break through um, as opposed to sort of like small optimizations. Um, we, in the last couple of years, have started to work with people at different levels. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit here. Um, but that's been our background thus far. Um, if you think we can be helpful or if you think someone would be a good candidate for mental coaching, um, we can be helpful sometimes, but what we don't do is um, like per session based or swing or excuse me, session based or like package type of work. We do six and 12 month retainers. Um, so it usually only makes someone makes sense for someone who's really investing in this stuff um, and wants to do so over the long term. But there are a handful of resources that we can circulate um, that can be helpful for like less committed levels or um you know, people who just want to start learning about this, but not invest in it like they're a, a competitive player. Um, and I really love this quote, um, which is, we, I was lucky enough to have dinner um, with Butch Harmon. Um, and one thing he said to me that's really stuck is, I thought I did what your mom did until I met your mom. Um, and sort of the point of that is like, instructors do a lot of this work and they do a really wonderful job of it. Um, and I think there's a spectrum of some instructors are really thinking about this stuff and really helping 
a lot of instructors on tour now are, you know, wanting their players to have a mental resource because it just improves the team and, um, you know, helps the player. Um, and also, um, there's a lot of work that mental coaches do that's unique and it's a whole, like the same way you've spent five to 30 years or more helping someone develop um, or learning how to help someone develop their swing. There's people in our camp that have done the same to help them develop their mind. Um, and so there's a lot of work that we can do that's different. Um, one thing we're thinking about doing is like our, our best case is as opposed to working with clients directly is um, helping more instructors work with their players on this stuff as well. Um, or at least sort of like doing a little bit of both. Um, and so we're, we've played around with the idea of like having a sort of seminar or program that could look in the future, like a TPI for the mind sort of program. Um, and so if folks are interested in that, then I'm going to put a link into the chat and it's mostly just like a research sort of survey to see if people, um, if there's an appetite for something like that. Um, and that would be in the summer. Um, a little bit of background just on the different products that we have. Um, so Cape Coaching on the right is just the work we do, sort of six to 12 month retainers with folks to really dive in. Um, in the middle bucket, we've done work with um, different country clubs um, to do like a junior coaching workshop. Um, and that can be an interesting thing that um, we can chat more about um, if you're interested in something like that. Um, we're working on developing some sort of video content. Um, like I, so I personally sometimes get swing lessons, but a lot of my swing instruction comes from YouTube and reading articles. Um, and that's been like a really developed thing, you know, in online of the last five or 10 years. Um, I think the mental resources that you can find for free are like super thin and not nearly as advanced as the swing stuff or like swing drills that you can get from YouTube. And so we're trying to figure out a way to like how to bring this stuff to more people. Um, and that's what we've been working on over the last year. And like that, the TPI for the mind example is something we might try, but generally we're just trying to figure out how to bring this stuff to more people instead of just top pros. Um, and then the last piece is um, we're, looking into developing a way to work with um, teams, mostly D1 golf teams um, to help them with this work and introduce um, this type of work to them at that level. Um, that is all we have. Um, would love to answer questions that people have or about certain products or challenges that their players are facing or whatever. Um, yeah, anything we can do to be helpful, but um, that's just a little primer. If you have more questions, I'll drop the link for the survey and I'll drop the link or I'll drop my email in there and you can email me with uh, anything that I can be helpful with. Rich and Noah, I have a question for you guys, if you uh, don't mind me sharing here. Please. So I liked and thank you for the presentation. It was awesome stuff. And um, one thing I like to tell my players is golf swings don't win tournaments. People do. And I think that's something that you guys that I've seen you guys do really well. Um, an example I would give is like, this is at the players championship last year. I'm seeing Max Homa sit with, I think it's Caddy's name's Joe, Max and Joe and Julie and Mark sitting. Like if anyone's been to the players, like the putting green, you can kind of sit on a hill and you can basically overlook the putting green and it's right in front of everybody. And they're sitting down having a conversation on how they all speak to each other and specifically how Max and Joe speak to each other during a round of golf which i thought was enlightening because like these guys are at this level they're trying to find every single way they can get better i guess my question to you would be is like how do you create awareness in your players that hey we need to address something in the mental game right because that can be a tricky subject to some people like some people don't want to hear oh it's mental they want to go back to the, the technical part but how do you create awareness in that with a player I'm going to pass this to Rich, but I want to say my brief experience with this is like, I, I think for my mom, I've only seen when that conversation has worked well, because that player has ended up in our camp. Um, and I know like the people that have talked publicly about this, like it, it's often a caddy thing. 
Um, like Wyndham, it was his caddy bringing it up to him after seeing him be frustrated on the course. Um, it was Bones with JT. Um, and I think like, I think it was Joe who said like he was worried sick about, and I'll, I'll send this video out because that is what happened. Max talked about this. It, it, he was worried about how to bring this up to Max because he didn't want to make it seem like there was a weakness he had, um, but more of like an opportunity he had. Um, and like how to do that, especially as, you know, like the caddy and finding the right way to do that and the right space to do that. So I think long story short, it's hard. Um, I'll send that video of Max talking about how Joe did it for him in a way that Max really appreciated, which was just sort of like honest, simple and clear. Um, but we'll let Rich sort of answer more and maybe talk a little bit about how instructors can do that, too. Sure. And, and John, you're, are you talking about from, uh, you know, an instructor point of view, if you have a, a client that, you know, maybe could be help, use some help mentally, um, how do you approach that? that yeah, part? like, like leading into like, a, like, we all work with some junior golfers, let's say, let's, you know, and you know, the person like in the lesson, she, she looks pretty good. And then she goes out to the course, and it's not transferring and how to bring up because it can be a tricky subject saying, hey, like, I think alluding to what Noah said, it, um, you got to do it in a way that's an opportunity. And how do you create the self-awareness around the player of, hey, I do need to address this because that can be tricky. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to say that in my experience, it is more prevalent that people are thinking about, um, you know, there's something mental that's going on. There's, there's something in my performance that I'm not performing the way I want to. I'm working really hard at it. And, but they don't know exactly what that answer is. It's kind of mysterious. It's a mental thing. But I hear you that some, some players, you know, aren't aware or not thinking about that. They're going to think about mechanics or going to think about something else or really not that open, you know, and so approaching them to do that. Um, so there's a few things I'd like to say about that. One is that um, from, let's say on the, on the tour, you know, I just want to go to uh, Julie. So the thing is that, First, you know, she said that a lot of her uh, clients come from referrals from, um, you know, caddies, but also agents, people that really know those players well, right, and help them to uh, to to get some some mental help outside of just um, to, for their performance. Um, and I, being at the, um, for example, I want to say also say that, you know, what you were talking about, Max. And Joe taught in, in their conversations and that good communication can be so helpful mentally for a player, right? And how do you um, create that, you know, uh, between those two people, but also the culture that that's important. Um, I want to say that when I was at the U.S. Open, um, you know, um, just observing what Julie was doing, she was working with uh, Bones and, and JT and uh, she was there to mediate, you know, between them a conversation and, and sit down and, and really help that conversation and there and develop that, that, uh, um, what, uh, what Joe, what you've observed with, with Joe and, uh, and, uh, and Max, but also, um, I, what you're really saying is that, um, you know, I think that, um, just the awareness that, you know, how somebody is thinking about themselves internally you know, can really affect their, affect their performance, but mentally, psycholo psycholo psychologically, um, how they're doing um, can affect their performance. And I would agree with you that in lots of times, people aren't aware of all the things that they're, that, um, they're doing that, uh, that does impact their performance. And how do you actually bring that up as an instructor to a player to, to get some help. But the other thing also, I, I just want to say, it's like, where do you go for that? You know, outside of, you know, instructor, you can say, yeah, you, you can do, you can see that, but then where do you go to, to, to uh, send somebody or where do you refer them? Something Noah was saying, you know, to go to YouTube, there's the, the information's, you know, sparse. Um, but I agree with you that, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure in, in your position, how many players you've seen, how much you, see that they can be helped by their, um, you know, uh, some mental coaching, you know, and uh, there's so many like, aspects of that. 
Like I have them keep a mental scorecard almost of how many shots you hit in a round of golf that you weren't committed to, to create awareness to stuff like that. And you can bridge the gap that way. And then you can start saying, Hey, you know, Rich, like, you know, someone, so-and-so is hitting, you know, 30 shots for a two round tournament, you know, not committed and then really defining what committed is. And then you're starting the ball rolling of you're creating a really good communication like loop with the student, the player, the mental coach, and then you can go in that direction. So that's what I see you guys doing. And like, I, pre- I respect it. I appreciate it. It's not easy. No, I, and, and it's a great point about being on a team, right? Yeah. Developing teams and, and to help players. And um, I think Metro coaches are becoming a much part of the team than just physical training and physical coaching. And it is incredibly helpful. That's the thing is that I, I think it's one of the reasons why Julie's been so in, incredibly um, successful with her players is looking at their in, entire lives and um, how that's infecting, affecting their performance on the golf course. And where are those opportunities to be able to uh, do things? And, uh, I, I can give another example on that. That's a, it's a unique example. Like one of the, uh, Julie and I share a client, so he'll be, he'll rename nameless. Um, and in our off season work, uh, the question or one of the things this client said was like, Julie said, I need to be nicer to myself, like off the golf course. And he went and bought a, um, a La Marcosa, the, it's like an Italian espresso machine. It's like he'd never done something nice for himself. It's just golf 99% of the time. And when you start hearing this, the client say things like that, they hit a bad shot and it doesn't become that important to them. It doesn't carry as much weight. And you can see the trickle down effect of I'm being nice to myself off the golf course and then on the golf course. You know, that, you know, the three putt doesn't sting as much or, you know, you shoot 71, it's, it, it carries weight. And, and I just, I love that about the work that you guys do. Yeah. I, I what, what you're saying right there is, is, uh, is a great example. I mean, um, uh, I have a, a, a player that I work with, with the, L, on the LPGA tour. And, and, uh, that was a, a huge thing for her to be able to be, uh, kinder to herself and and uh, that truly helped her you know out on the golf course uh, um, perform better yeah i think sean you had a couple questions yeah rich i got a question for you um comes from one of our chris george one of our uh pros here in the area that uh, is very uh, out there um on social media and uh, would you comment on the use of social media pre-event or during or for uh steering for juniors or college players is there evidence of research that discusses if there's distractions influence that in, influence their performance that's a big topic and um, <laughs> um you know i think that uh it has been a a, a, a topic with players i have a co- you know uh, i have a college player that is uh is a you know almost an influencer and then i have players that are on the on tours and and uh it has been it's something to to talk about how they deal with social media really how is an important topic and being um to cover and for them to be able to handle social media um optimally for themselves everybody's a little different you know some people um can can handle different things than 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 other uh, others but i would say that it has become a, an important you know category in helping players be able to perform um you know uh, on the golf course absolutely i would also add to that um like i, I think it really depends on the player like I, I know my mom well there's certain people she'll send like before they tee off they'll be watching videos of like i don't know Kobe scoring, you know, 65 points or some, you know, really sort of, I don't know, like cool sports, get them really in the zone sort of thing. And then like, I hear, you know, like before the U S open, I was watching my mom talk to Wyndham and I was like, wow, what is like the cool, you know, Kobe quote, my mom's telling Wyndham. And it turned out they were actually just talking about opening up a uh, fish, like taco, restaurant um and so i think to say like some players maybe want to be brought down and some players need to be brought up and i don't know 
what they're digesting on social and, um, you know, what the content is, but it's different for each player and, and what helps them get into a competitive mindset. Well, that's going to trans, that's going to lead good Noah right into another kind of question is, uh, Linda's asking, is there some kind of questionnaire? I mean, I know from past experiences and in, in talking to some people that do work with tour players that, you know, they're, they're I met, I met a player and he was just off. I mean, it was like, I didn't want to have anything to do with the gentleman. And I later talked to one of somebody that did work with him and he's like, you just don't ever know what's going on in their world, that there's things that could be going on off the course that happened to be where the gentleman was going through a divorce. And there was, you know, that off course present. Is there anything that like, is there a questionnaire that you guys put out there that, that kind of says, you know, maybe how they, you know, how, how does this perspective feel? Um, I kind of talked to my players kind of like you did there with, with some of the golf and the, in the middle and the clubs and stuff like that. And I kind of talked to them about there's balloons in each area. They got to be good with their family. They're, you know, got to be good socially. And, and they got to, I'm saying good as in feeling comfortable. And when there's air out of one of those balloons, you got to put that air in and, and, and kind of it, it's going to take from somewhere else. Is there some way, how do you find out what that, what that issue might be? Um, real, totally the, the right question. Um, I, I'll give my two cents and then give it to Rich. Um, I know my mom always asked players to start, do you need, do I need to get you going or bring you down? Um, cause I think that for whatever reason, those are sort of the path, the, the primary fork in the road that she sees when starting with players. Like, do I need to help you like play cocky and play confident? Um, or do I need to help you like chill out out there and, you know, love it out there and think less and just like be an athlete. Um, and so I think that's sort of the, the first fork that I see. Um, but there's not specifically a questionnaire, but I do think there's like primary challenges that um, our athletes experience and we'll let Rich give his two cents or comment on that. Yeah, there's so many aspects to, you know, just the topic of social media. But I was thinking, you know, it's like, um, you know, there could be a player that's getting um, comments, you know, to the on their social media to people who are, you know, putting uh, posting stuff to people who are, you know, just, um, you know, it's their go to uh, and to relax and and to spend time or to be immersed in it. I mean, there are all kinds of aspects of, of social media. I was just thinking about and the content itself. Um, but one of the things that's great about what we get to do is, you know, it doesn't mean that we have a questionnaire, but, you know, we get to uh, listen and, and have the time for things to come up. And um, often with my players, you know, it's either, I'm just thinking about um, them bringing up social media and things that they, you know, it, it, things that impacted themselves, um, you know, um, and uh, it just comes up in our conversation because there's space for it. And that's where, well, that's what we're doing. And, uh, um, and, and then I get to ask a lot of questions too. Um, and so the, uh, I get to explore to fi find out where are, the op what are the, where are the obstacles and where are the opportunities to be able to perform well. And social media, there's all kinds of things can be, um, e you know, even I'm, I'm thinking about one player that we just, you know, what was right for her was to use um, social media, but in, um, you know, uh, but, uh, but in, uh, I'm just thinking about the unique ways that she, that, that it did help her and also ways that she needed to put uh, boundaries around it that, that were obstacles for her. Okay. Like Sean, Thank you I there. Can... Uh but I can give you my, my experience, my experience with that. I know some, some players, like they won't use tournament. They, you know, they won't use social media Thursday through Sunday. Like yeah. it's off, like they won't even be on it. And then it helps them. It helps them get away from the FOMO of, you know, like the things they could or wish they were doing or don't have. And it turns that off. Um, 
turns off like the golf instruction stuff that pops up on your page, you know, cause Instagram's always listening to us. And, uh, so like, that's one Avenue that's, that's really helped him. And I know other people that they want to see highlights of themselves. It helps them, you know? And so like, they see it on, they come up on PGA tour. They're like, Oh, I love, I love this type of, uh, it shows me it's like, they're showing off part, you know? So I see it both sides of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rich, do you ever give them a personality test or, you know, there's, I know uh writer cup and stuff, they kind of do the personality test to try to see who's compatible with who and so forth. But, and I've had players that their college coach, when they were recruiting them, had them do a, do a personality profile. Do you ever do anything like that? Mm, not, not specifically, but I can see how there are lots of, you know, the Myers-Briggs or other tests that are really helpful personalities but I think for myself um I've spent so much time um doing that for uh in in the psychological realm that I already just by talking with them I'm already know so much about what's what's going on or who, wh how their personality might be is unique but I don't I don't do that myself uh, Julie I'm, I'm sorry Noah do you know anything that J Julie might do in that realm no, um, the only thing I've seen her do is like psychiatric testing for like ADHD or stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. uh, like there might be a reason a player gets especially angry or like has a harder time focusing or something like that. Um, but I, um, no, uh, tell the story about JB Holmes. I, I know I can like about yeah, you mean, the, a, yeah, you, you, you got it. <laughs> I mean, if anyone. I hope this doesn't come out of line with JB, but he didn't have a lot of confidence in himself as a, as a person. And JB's really smart. And one of Julie's ideas with JB was to take a, what is it called? Like a cognitive test maybe, or yeah. take like a IQ test. Yep. And he aced it and it came out like he was like a genius in so many different ways. And it came back like, he was really smart and it totally changed his dynamic of who he was as a person. Um, so it was a genius way of having him. It wasn't, it, it carries more weight and like, Hey man, you're really smart. Oh, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And then you see this come back. And it's like, wow, like, that's pretty impressive. Yep. Yeah. That's a great example. Well, no, there's some comments here that the, uh, of, of what you're saying there about the TPI for the mind that you're making a community and stuff. There's uh, several people that's kind of said, Hey, that would be a great, we would like to know more as PJ professionals. And I think that is uh, one of the things that uh, I guess I've learned in my career is that I can be good at things and I can and know a little bit about it enough to be dangerous. But I mean, ultimately we're going to be able to help our students a little bit. And then when they're ready to take it to a next level um, and, and kind of, make that commitment like you're talking about that's where we can turn it over to guys like you and kind of say hey here here we go this is uh you know i've taken as far as i can do but you need to see somebody like rich and, and let let you go through the process and, and kind of touch into that yeah yeah exactly that's great now if you have any more we're kind of coming up on the the hour here at two o'clock uh please let me know if you have any more questions here uh, we're going to kind of start wrapping it up here um, and uh, moving moving forward. Uh, I do want to thank Noah and Rich both and uh, for uh, being on here and obviously John Scott. And uh, I've got uh, John Scott and Sarah and uh, Bernie Najar now on the education uh, committee with me. So if you see these guys, one, thank them because uh, uh, we're opening up a new, you know, Mark Russo and I've been doing this for a little bit and I've kind of brought in some new people and, and wanted them to explore their minds or what they know. And John Scott first thing right off the bat was like, uh, I, I want to do Cape. And I say, like, let's go. So, uh, you know, definitely the ideas contact either John Scott, Sarah, or myself and, uh, let us know. But, uh, any more questions we've got, I think there was one there. Just uh, nope. Just really a thank you uh, from that last one. But uh, John Scott, yeah. I'll let you end it here. Yeah, thank thank you, uh, Noah and Rich, so much. And uh, like I, I really do encourage you guys to reach out to them. They can be a great resource for us. I mean, the end goal is 
helping our students enjoy the game and play better golf and we'll be better for it. Uh, your students will be better for it. Um, it's a win-win on both sides. So if I can be a, a help in any way, just reach out to me directly and, uh, you know, Noah and uh, Rich will leave their, some of their contact stuff and um, get the ball rolling. And then thank you. Thank you, Sean, for uh, um, having me. And thank you, Christine, for doing all the legwork behind it. Can't forget her. So thank you guys. May I introduce, interject a question? Go ahead, John. Yeah, I sent it in, but I don't know, may, may not have gotten it. But I've got a 16. I think, it, I think we kind of I went in. Yeah, go ahead. I kind of thought we answered it. Go ahead. Yeah, but I've got a 16 year old golfer. He just, he looks like a prototype tour player. And, you know, and he just functionally, physically, and functionally on the swing and his fitness, he looks like he should be on the tour. And yet mm. he, and he, he just, he, he just shoots eight, 10 strokes higher in, in tournaments. Where would you where would you start your process with a kid like that? Uh, I'd love to take that. The you know I'd ask a lot of questions. First, I want to know what's going on on the golf course. How you know um, you know course management, how they're thinking. But really, what I would get into is how they're how they're preparing. Uh, you know that the they're not testing well. Okay, they 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 might have really good mechanics. Their swing, they might be able to hit, perform well at the driving range. But what does that mean? Performing on the driving range and the short game area um, to really enhance your performance where people, you know, perform far better than what you would expect them to do based on what you see at the driving range. And also a big thing is like, what are they practicing? You know, 70% of shots are, you know, distance wedges on in. Most people are, are spending their time, you know, doing, doing something else. So really teaching them, you know, how, how they're spending their time um, and wow, what's going on when they're, uh, you know, what are all the, the factors? And I, you know, that, in, that affect that performance. And I also want to say the, you know, the things, the internal things, how they're thinking about themselves. If as a, as a, as a player, you, everybody has an elite player inside themselves. And so if you're tapping into that elite player, thinking of yourself like that, how you're talking, how you're practicing, how you're walking and so forth, all kinds of answers come and you perform far better. But, you know, how is that player you know, um, thinking about themselves and how they're, how they're performing internally can really affect uh, their score and their performance on the golf course? Oh, thank, you. Thank, thank you. That's helpful. <laughs> sure. All right. Uh, Matt Snyder, I'm going to kind of push that that message to Noah and uh, I'll let him answer it or Rich to answer that uh, specifically off of uh, here since we're kind of pushed a little bit towards the time side. Uh, but uh, John Scott, everybody, thank you very much and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everybody, for your time. Really appreciate it.